Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. And this is the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre. And tries to find an answer. Uh, Caroline, what are we looking into this week? What I have in front of me is Lizanne Froon and Chris Creamers? Yeah, so their names are Lisanne Froon, or Lisanne Froon, and Chris Kramers. Um, This week we're diving back into the area of true crime, or maybe not. Uh, We're going to be discussing the disappearance of Lisanne Froon and Chris Kramers, who were Dutch tourists that disappeared during a hike in the Panama rainforest. In the rainforest? Mm Mm-hmm. So not not like near a major city, probably? They were near a major city. That's part of the weirdness here. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a sad story. It's one that has a lot of mystery still to it. But hopefully, now that things are getting nicer outside, I mean, it's disgusting today, but it'll work as a warning to our listeners to be very careful in the great outdoors and especially in unfamiliar territory. Yeah, as all as all true crime stories should. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For this episode, I'll be relying heavily on an incredibly in-depth series of articles by Jeremy Kreit in the Daily Beast, and these were collected under the title "The Lost Girls of Panama: The Full Story." So, mm. thanks, Jeremy. Always like to credit uh, big pieces of research that we do. So Lisanne Froon and Chris Kremers, um, they were only 22 and 21, respectively, when they disappeared in April 2014. Chris and Lisanne had met while working part-time at the same cafe in Den Kleinenhop, I think. Okay. In the city of Amersfoort in the Netherlands, and they became close friends. Both of them were attending university, both were outstanding students, so eventually uh, they decided to share an apartment together. Seemed like they had a lot of the same interests. Mm Mm-hmm. Fast friends. Yeah. A real Laverne and Shirley. Mm Mm-hmm. Lisanne was outgoing, an amateur actress, and she wanted to study art history in graduate school after doing some traveling. Chris was athletic, she made her... She majored in psychology, and she loved photography. That was like her amateur hobby. They just need to find like a sarcastic guy and a meathead, and then they'll have a sitcom going. <laughs> yeah, or a and d group, I guess. <laughs> well, God willing. On a break from school, they decided to enjoy some travel time, but even this vacation would be in the spirit of doing good for others and enriching themselves. They decided to journey to Boquete, Panama, as volunteer social workers where they would be teaching English to the local children and learning uh, fluent Spanish themselves. Wow. Yeah. It's a much more productive vacation than I've ever taken. (laughs) Yeah. So frustratingly, someone had miscalculated. I'm not sure if it was the girls or the organization they were working with. But either way, they arrived in Panama a week early. And Chris noted in her diary that the assistant director had been very rude and not at all friendly. And the program clearly wasn't ready for their arrival. Okay, so they drove them out into the jungle? Is that what you're... (laughs) No, it's just part of it. Um, A lot of this happens right at the top of April. So it seems like a natural starting point for spending a a month helping people out, you know, teaching English. Um, I think it was like a Monday, too. It's just a little strange that they would start something like this a week into the month. Yeah. But whatever. Wait, is there an angle to this that the whole the whole program was a was a Oh, there might be an angle to like literally everything I say. Okay. But a lot of it remains very mysterious. So, just prepare yourself for that. Mhm. Um, so the morning of the girl's disappearance, Chris wrote in her diary, there is not yet a place or work for us, so we could not start. The school thought it odd, as it was all planned since months ago. Tomorrow they will try and get a hold of the head teacher. This was a real disappointment. Anyway, go with the Panamanian flow. Unfortunately, this would be the last line of Chris's diary, and their mix-up never would be rectified. Wow. Yeah. She did potentially write a nice Life is Good t-shirt there, though, at the end. I guess. So that's a legacy of some kind. (laughs) 
Witnesses later said they saw Chris and Lisanne leave the trailhead just north of Boquete at about 10 a.m. that morning, and it was Tuesday, April 1st. So we're going to be going through this timeline a lot. The, f- the initial hike, Tuesday, April 1st. Got it. The girls had dressed only in very light clothing with just one backpack between them, so it seemed very clearly that they weren't intending for this to be a very long hike. Right. I mean... Well, and they don't know if work's going to start tomorrow. Right. Um, You know, they're wearing tank tops, shorts. They only have one backpack, so not even both of them had their backpacks. It seemed like it was just a quick hike. There are reports that a dog named Blue accompanied them some ways up the trail. This dog may have also been the pet of the family that was hosting the girls in their home, or more likely it was owned by the owners of the local Il Pianista restaurant. Um, And a large percentage of web sleuths believe this. I wonder how, how do you, what's the evidence that points to the dog's name being Blue, but doesn't give you the owner? (laughs) I don't know. I just read it in different places, but most people think he's owned by the restaurant owners. Okay. Um, Blue apparently accompanied many tourists on their hike up the trail. You can find evidence of this at a blog called Chris and Dan's Panamanian Adventure, where they docu- got document Blue tagging along during their pianista hike on February 17th, 2014, just a month and a half before the disappearance of oh, so, the girls. So that's how. This dog is like a known thing. He's a fixture. Just we don't necessarily know who owns the dog. Yeah, I think that's kind of it. Um, he apparently accompanied many tourists on this hike. He enjoyed himself a lot. I don't know. The trail the girls took is called the Pianista, which means piano player. Mm-hmm. It's uh, because it climbs much like piano keys, you know how they appear, ladder-like up from Boquete to the Continental Divide, 6,660 feet above. And yes, that number has been speculated on, Sean. <laughs> the, so Satanism gets involved here at some point? <laughs> um, I, I don't talk about it, but I, yeah, people are like, well, did, you, did you notice this? It's like, okay, and? Well, shame on you for not talking about it. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm going to be handling this with kid gloves just because it's so recent and so tragic. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to be doing a lot of fun stuff with this one, unfortunately. It's real sad. Okay, press on. So the Continental Divide marks where on the western side the rivers flow downhill into the Pacific Ocean, while those on the eastern side flow to the Caribbean Sea. So this, I guess it's kind of like a, a mountainous area. Mm-hmm. The Boquete region itself is known as Little Switzerland due to its stunning scenery, including meadows and lakes and forests. Very picturesque. They're great hot chocolate. <laughs> Tourism is a big thing in Boquete, and there's a lot of expats flocking to the area for retirement and outdoor adventurers taking advantage of safaris, rafting, rock climbing, and of course hiking. Now they don't have safaris in Switzerland. This sounds this sounds better. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean the pictures are are absolutely stunning, and I can uh, show you some of those soon. And it also helps that Panama has a reputation as an offshore tax haven. <laughs> well, sure, of course it does. But even despite this, Panama and Boquete itself are some of the safest areas in Latin America, which, again, is very attractive to tourists. Sure, yeah. Well, a tax haven's going to be safe because the, you know, it's, it's going to be a playground for rich people, right? Mm-hmm. So there had been a previous tourist disappearance. This was British backpacker um, Alex Humphrey in 2009. He was staying at a hospital. A hostel. I didn't dive too far into his case, but no link has been identified between his disappearance and Lasanne and Chris's. Just thought I'd mention it. Uh-huh. So one of the most chilling aspects of this case, and I think the reason why it, it's captured the interest of so many, is because of later discoveries, which included the girl's camera that was found um, that had documented their hike. Oh. Mm-hmm. Now that you say that, does it ring a bell a little bit? This rings a vague bell, but why don't you continue? You'll find pictures from this on threads that are like 
pictures taken before tragedy or, you know, stuff like that. I think it's a big TikTok thing as well. It would be. Yeah. So, And you would be on tragedy TikTok, by the way. <laughs> Listen, I just stumble onto it. It seems the girls made fairly good time up to the top of the Pianista. Um, so if they were leaving the trailhead at 10 a.m., they reached there at about 1 p.m. And this, you know, works perfectly well with the timestamps on Lisanne's camera. And it looked like they did so alone. Um, there's some question as to whether Blue actually was with them because there are no pictures of him that they took. And you think, cute dog hiking with you, definitely going to take some pictures. Yeah. Um, Why does Blue figure so heavily into this story? Or will that come later? A little bit later, yeah. So the, otherwise, there's no indication that anyone else was with them. Not that they knew of or saw. It was just the two of them. The Daily Beast notes that geographical features in the final few photos on the camera, um, from the daytime at least, indicate by mid-afternoon on April 1st, the pair had left the Pianista and probably accidentally crossed over to the other side of the Continental Divide. Which would put them... Not heading back to Boquete. Ah, these photos seem to indicate that they had wandered onto a network of trails not maintained by any official associated with Barrow National Park, where the Pianista is located. And these sorts of trails aren't meant for tourists and aren't even traveled by guides, but are used almost exclusively by the indigenous peoples living within the rainforest, including the Ngobe tribe. Okay, and we're talking about them specifically? Well, they will come back later i think they're the most relevant to this area okay so not somewhere a couple of white college kids should be wandering i don't think it's anywhere anyone unexperienced should be wandering so that was it until nine weeks later when the backpack containing the camera was allegedly discovered no trace of lazanne or chris was seen again Mm -hmm. The photos remained um, as an eerie trail of crumbs to try and assemble into an answer to the big question, where was Lisanne Froon and Chris Kramers? Oh, this wasn't the role of film I was thinking of, by the way. I was thinking of a different story. Well, at least there's that. Mm -hmm. Now, where they were is not the only question in this case. There are exponentially more questions than answers here. But let's start at the beginning. Sure. That that was kind of an overview mm -hmm. of, of what happened. The girls were only supposed to be in Panama for a month, but this might have been extended to five weeks due to the arrival mix-up if they were planning to stay for a month after they started the work. Right. You know. You might have to get a new flight out. Mm -hmm. Whatever the case, they had time on their hands before the beginning of their volunteer work, so it seems they made the logical choice to do some sightseeing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chris and Lisanne were seen in the company of two Dutchmen during the first couple weeks of their stay. Uh, there are some pictures with them. I'm sure. I don't know if they were fellow volunteers or, I mean, you know, you run into like another Dutch person on your trip, someone your age or whatever. I'm sure you're going to hang out with them. Sure. Because they're the only one around who speaks your language. Yeah. I'm unclear whether it was these two guys or another similarly Dutch pair, witnesses <laughs> said, were having lunch with the girls the day of the disappearance. But apparently, according to witnesses, the girls had lunch with two Dutch men on April 1st. How many pairs of Dutch men can <laughs> be wandering around Panama? I'm also unsure as to whether this was before the hike or alongside the trail. Other reports, like I said, stated they were on the trail around 10 a.m., so that's pretty early for lunch. Maybe yeah. it was breakfast. I could don't be, know. There could be translation issues along the way here because it's happening in South America, but two Dutch people. Mm -hmm. Witnesses say that a certain tour guide, uh, who we're going to discuss a lot, a local Panamanian rancher, met with Chris and Lisanne less than a day before they disappeared on the campus of Spanish by the River, the language school where they were set to work during their stay in Boquete. Do we have a name on the rancher? I'm pretty sure it's Feliciano Gonzalez. Okay. Okay. 
At that meeting, Feliciano offered them a full package tour, including a guided hike up the Pianista and an overnight stop at his ranch deep in the jungle on the far side of the mountains. Um, I don't think if a rancher just invites you alone to his ranch Absolutely deep in not. the jungle, you should go go with him. Absolutely not. Especially like two girls, too. No way. Yeah. That's um listen, that's a big tip for our listeners. Don't yeah. don't follow strange ranchers into the jungle. Yeah. Um so apparently the girls declined this offer, but elsewhere I've found that this guide, Gonzalez, has stated he had a guided tour planned with the girls for April second, which is Wednesday, the next day. Okay. So I'm not sure which is true. I'm not sure. They, if they did have a hike set with Gonzalez on the second, why would they make the similar hike the day before unguided? Right. Um, a Dutch masseuse named Sigrid. And again, maybe this is just a common place for Dutch people to vacation. It mu- It sounds like it. <laughs> uh, she saw the girls on March 31st, the day before they hiked. And she said that they chatted enthusiastically about undertaking the trail the next day. So it wasn't... A spur of the moment decision. Sure, yeah. I'm not sure if Gonzalez was mistaken about them agreeing to go on the hike on the second, or maybe the girls. I could totally see this if they were uncomfortable. Um, say, oh yeah, we'll meet you on the second, and then just intending to ghost him and never show up. Mm-hmm. You know, so they didn't have to like. They could kind of get out of the awkward situation of being rude but also not risk anything, you know? Yeah, except that guy standing out there by himself waiting for them. Yeah, but if they never showed up, he'll, he's not going to find them, right? Yeah, but the poor guy. Unless he was a creepy guy. Who knows? I mean, they... I don't know if they had an actual tour set for the second. It doesn't seem likely, because why would you do the same hike two days in a row? Right. Right, that is weird, but that's what the tour guide said? Yes, and this will play into what happens later. Uh Uh-huh, I imagine it will. So it's a real discrepancy in the case. Some material the girls had apparently browsed before deciding to take the hike calls the Pianista Trail a pleasant day hike and steady, leisurely before you reach a steeper path. Also, it says the path winds deep into the forest that you can turn back at any time. So it seems pretty innocuous. I doubt they would have felt they were in any peril whatsoever taking that hike. Sure, yeah. Definitely not facing mortal danger today. Mm-hmm. How clearly are the... Do, well, maybe you might not know this. How clearly are the trails marked that you can just accidentally wander off into, like, uncharted tribal territory? From what I've read, it's fairly clear, at least to the summit, because you're taking the same trail back, I think. That was the only part that wasn't totally clear to me. Um but it seems like, yeah, this is obviously where you would go. A French hiker quoted on the exhaustive evidence collection website, cremersfrune.pbworks.com, so check that out if you want to see any of this stuff for yourself, stated that when they created recreated the path in 2019, quote, the path continuing beyond the Mirador takes the form of a single and narrow path. There it is impossible to get lost by continuing in the same direction for at least an hour and a half. In this setup, it is also very difficult to escape someone and be able to flee in the direction of Boquete if someone is coming from there. Mm. So it seems there's one main path, and if that path is blocked by some force... Something or someone. Yeah, it would be really hard to take that path back to Boquete. And this will also become clearer? Yeah. Another quote is from a Westerner who lives in the Boquete area. And they state that basically the path becomes exponentially harder to follow past the initial cow fields. Um, So perhaps this could be a point where some may get lost. So the photos on the recovered camera, and we'll talk about the recovery in a little bit, they're known by number names. So if you remember the olden days of digital cameras, every photo you took had a name uh, that was a number. You could change that. Uh, if you wanted to, but usually you just keep it, and it would go up um, the more you took. So it starts at one, and then it keeps going. 
Yeah, I um, use a camera at work that still use yes, cameras still mm-hmm. use that same system. Actually, your phone uses that same system. Sure, you don't really see the the image names usually. So, photo five hundred five is taken at one twenty p.m. and it's of Lisanne in a location about twenty minutes post summit down the other side. So it seems like they're on the right trail here. Now, again, I'm a little confused as to how the trails work, Mm -hmm. so I apologize. I'm just going by the evidence. Then at 1.39 p.m., and it's really amazing that your phone can show this, like even in 2014, the network connection uh, for the iPhone was lost. So like 1.39 specifically, they see they lost reception. Okay. So after this point in the trail or on the mountain or whatever – Reception is just non-existent in the area, and the iPhone never reconnected to reception again. Is there like a really good coverage map that kind of shows you how far into the jungle they would have been to lose Yeah, it? and there are, there are theories as to where they were at certain points. Photo 507 and 508 that have Lasan in them were taken at 1.54 p.m., about an hour down the other side from the summit, heading away from Boquete. This is the last photo that was taken during the day. The other side of the summit. So it sounds like they took a wrong path down the mountain. At some point. I can't really figure out where. But by 1.39. They made it to the summit, and after that, something happened where they were in the wrong area. Well, do you think... Is it possible they were just looking at Google Maps for for how to get there, like how to walk there uh, until their phones lost service? I don't know. I mean, possibly. Um, It depends how crowded the hiking area is, too. I mean, there were witnesses that saw them. Yeah. So there were people around-ish. Any, like almost any hike you do. You'll run into one or two people. Or lots, yeah. right? Uh, it Going up and down. When I was in Puerto Rico, we went to the uh, rainforest and did a hike. And it was like a, just a steady line of people. You know what I mean? Going mm-hmm. uh, both directions. Yeah. It, it's probably not. I mean, from the pictures, it's not that populated. But again, people saw them. Um, so the sleuths at the PB Works page and on the Reddit r slash Kremers Froon are pretty amazing and they found that 20 minutes in the same um anti boquete direction after photo 508 would have led the girls to a second stream and 15 minutes after that is a cow paddock area okay but after 508 no locations were recorded in the same way as previously so you're seeing a nice landscape you're taking a selfie or whatever they weren't taking pictures like that anymore so you couldn't really be sure where they were after 508. What were they taking pictures of? We'll get there. Okay. Um, so they could have, after 508, walked off the path and into the jungle, arrived at the cow paddock and got lost because the cow tracks um, leading down to the field kind of walk over the trail, any trail that's there. Okay, yep. Or they came off the path after the cow paddock and there went into the jungle. Or there was third party involvement affecting their actions. Right. And I have a feeling a lot of the rest of this podcast will be dedicated to the third option. Um, a good amount. We're going to talk about all options. And no matter what, the jungle area would be incredibly hard to navigate without professional guidance or equipment. And the girls really had neither. Barely had hiking equipment. Mm -hmm. So the phones were found. And I'm sure this could have been accessed. Um, I don't know how things were in 2014. But this was found via the phones. So during these initial calls, the correct pins were entered into the phones. So that means like, any other cell phone, it was probably the owner accessing it. It's your password to get into your phone, to right. unlock it. At 4.39 p.m. on April 1st, so this is around two and a half hours since the last pictures, a call was made to 112 from Chris's iPhone. 
112 is a common emergency phone number, which is used in the Netherlands. But unfortunately, even if they did have reception, it seems the Panamanian emergency number is 911. It was made from her phone? Yes. From Chris's iPhone to emergency. With no service. Mm -hmm. What time? I'm sorry. Uh, 4.39 p.m. So they summited around 1.20. Mm -hmm. Um, The last daytime pictures were taken uh, after that at 1.54-ish. And then at 4.39, this phone call. And no phone activity in between there? No. Doesn't seem like it anyway. So I'm not sure if calls made to 112 in 2014 would have automatically redirected to 911 in Panama. I know it's something that they do in America Mm. and other places where if you try another country's emergency number, it'll automatically reroute you. That makes sense. That's a good practice. Yeah. So maybe that is what would have happened, but I'm not sure. But it's a completely moot point, right? Because they didn't have any cell phone service? Yes. So it wouldn't have mattered anyway. A call was then made from Lasanne's Samsung phone soon after at 4.51 p.m., also to 112. Mm -hmm. And again, neither of these calls connected. There was no service. And I think even when your phone appears to have no service, if there's anything that it can find when you're dialing an emergency number, and this is true for now. I don't know if it's true years ago. um, It will use that prioritizes that tiny little amount of reception you might have to put through that emergency number. Right. But if there's nothing, there's nothing. There's nothing. And there was nothing. So some sources stay, say that the owners of the Il Pianista restaurant became alarmed when their dog, Blue, returned home that night alone, as they had known he'd left with the Dutch girls. Interesting. Okay. So and the he dog never... makes it out of this just fine. So he follows people on their whole hike with them and comes back with them? It seems. I mean, it, it seems from the blog post of the two guys that were hiking and taking pictures of Blue that that is common. So the dog's, boy, Blue. the dog's fine. Take that happy bit of news and hold it tight because there's not much else happy in this story. Well, he's sweet. And again, we're not totally sure if the dog was even there, because why wouldn't you take pictures of a dog that's hiking with you, you know? Um, yes. So why would that alert the owners? I don't know. It could be Blue was only with them for a little bit. I, yeah. I, I don't believe that this dog always follows <laughs> a party all the way there and all the, the way pianista. back. Well, and not only that, he's just so loyal to each just individual person mm-hmm. he meets. He's like, you are mine for <laughs> three hours. Lasanne's parents stopped receiving text messages around this time in the evening, and both women had been texting their parents daily with updates on their trip. Then on the morning of April 2nd, another call was made at 6.58 a.m. to 112, the emergency number, from Lasanne's phone. Didn't connect. What time? 6.58 a.m. on the 2nd. Wow. Wow. And once again, she put her pin in. To, yes. To open so, the phone. Until I say so, all I both of the phones had pins, and both of them were being input by their owners. It seemed, or someone who knew the pin. At eight a.m. on the second, the girls supposedly missed their appointment with Feliciano to guide them up the pianista. Yep. Remember, this is like one of the most wonky parts of this story. Mm-hmm. Um. Like, is he covering up something by saying this? And they had never accepted his offer in the first place. Right. Did they make an appointment with him, attending to ghost him and just go themselves the day before? Did they meet some cute guys at lunch who were going to the pianista? Yeah. Again. Oh, there's no guys in the photos, though. There's no guys in the photos. And they did take pictures with the Dutch guys they were hanging out with. And they were in the pictures and stuff. So I'm not sure what the the real story is and neither is anyone else that's why there's suspicion on this guy but this is when feliciano gonzalez says he knew something was up so around 9 a.m he somehow obtained the key to the girl's room to see if they spent the night there what (laughs) maybe he was genuinely concerned or maybe he knew the host family personally and wanted to check in why didn't he go Right to the police, A number one, though. I I don't know. Maybe he wasn't that concerned 
maybe it was on his, his way back home and he wanted to stop in and make sure everything was okay. I really, I don't know. It's so strange that the like hotel owner would give him- It was the... a host family, so I think they Oh, were... that the host, fa- sorry, yes. Uh, that the host family would go, yes, come right in. Yeah. Unless maybe they knew him and they were like, oh yeah, well, let's check it out. So I don't... <sighs> There are a lot of possibilities. I don't want to put too much suspicion on this guy if he was really just trying to help. Um, sure, just like um, <laughs> what was his name? The the sledge maker from uh, um, Hinter Kaifek. Ugh. Well, allegedly, it's all alleged. So it seems like he confirmed that they weren't around and they hadn't been. Ten fifty three a.m. A call to. 112 and 911 from the Samsung no connection. Mm-hmm. At 1:56 p.m., a call made from the same phone to 112 and 911 did have a short connection to the network but disconnected after a second or two. This is the only time any of the calls or the phone itself connected to like cell phone service. Wow. Now that so that doesn't immediately give God, in a perfect world, that would immediately give the authorities like a GPS location on that phone and you would go like, "Yeah, oh, there's a phone in the middle of the jungle that called 911 and disconnected real fast. And maybe the technology is better now. Um, maybe you need to be, maybe it's like phone tracing in movies where you need to be on the phone a certain amount of time before it can do that. I uh-huh. don't know. Um, so... At 4.13 p.m., a 6M earthquake occurred in the region, but it didn't seem like super serious, I guess, because there wasn't much else that I found about it. What does 6M mean? Now, this was something that was noted on the timeline on the PB Works page, um, but didn't seem to be of, like, major concern elsewhere, but I did want to mention it. M is magnitude, it looks like. There we go. At 6.14 p.m., the iPhone made a call to 112 that didn't connect, and a screenshot was taken. Um, I don't know if this was like an accidental thing. Sometimes I accidentally screenshot on my phone. Sure, and all we can tell from that is that the battery was low and there was no service? Yeah, I think so. At 7.30 p.m., Feliciano Gonzalez and Eileen, a staff member from Spanish by the River School, visited the local police station to inform police of the girl's disappearance. So it seems he's probably got confirmation that they weren't at the house, maybe asked around a couple people, went to the school, and then they decided to go to the police together. So far, less than suspicious from from him, honestly. Mm -hmm. Unless he didn't have that appointment with them in the first place. That's the one of the weirdest parts of this to me. It's like, what's the story there? That is tough. We'll have to get back to that later. Yeah. So apparently the two returned again to the police station at 9.30 p.m. I don't know if the police had asked them to make some additional checks and, you know, just check in with more people before saying that these were missing people. Mm -hmm. But at this point, they officially declared Chris and Lisanne as missing persons. And that is when the search, of course, um, really kicks into high gear And some of the issues with the search effort come to play. And we'll talk about that after the break. Caroline, we're halfway through already? Uh, Maybe a little less than halfway through, but yeah. I just don't know how we're going to... We know like less than nothing. It's been question after question. So uh, I I look forward to wrapping wrapping these, these... I look forward to wrapping these things up after the break. This episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Do you have what it takes to go into the mind of a serial killer? The body? The soul? Or perhaps to solve a horrific case? When you join Hunt a Killer, you receive a box of cryptic clues mailed to you each month to test your detective skills and challenge even the most brilliant minds in a game designed to give you a journey into the mind of a killer so you can escape. And I hope you escape with the answers that you need. 
Input our code SCARYSQUAD20 for 20% off. That's SCARYSQUAD20, S-C-A-R-Y-S-Q-U-A-D-2-0 for 20% off when you sign up for your first subscription box at huntakiller.com and find out a few of the guts to hunt a killer. That's again, Scary Squad 20 for 20% off. Hunt a killer. Join the hunt today. Welcome back. When last we left you, the search for Lisanne Froon and Chris Kramers was just going to kick into high gear. And these two girls had been missing for, what, under 48 hours at this point, right? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, local and international media portrayed the official search efforts by SINAPROC. That's the acronym. It's basically na- uh, Panama's National Service for Civil Protection. It sounds like a depression drug. <laughs> they described uh, their search as prompt and efficient. But there are many who disagree, including Feliciano Gonzalez himself. Well, you're going to describe your own search as prompt and efficient. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Gonzalez told Jeremy Kreit at the Daily Beast, quote, those girls could have been saved if the Sinoproc people knew how to do their jobs. And though there is suspicion on Mr. Gonzalez, others do agree with this view. Another guide named John Tornblum, who has 10 years of experience in the Boquete area, said, quote, we were out looking for the girls three or four days before Sinoproc even got involved. The first 24 hours are key for a search and rescue operation. Yeah, that's what they say, right? If you hit 48 hours, you're done, I think is the popular expression. Yeah. Uh, Tornblom concluded that the authorities hesitated to start a full-scale search because they thought the girls might be out on a party somewhere instead of really missing. Oh, on a party. <laughs> yeah. Then, when the government did finally get involved, experienced guides and searchers like himself were ordered to stand down while Sinoproc conducted its own search. Almost like they didn't want anything to be found. (laughs) We're the ones who know the area, but they cut us out. That rescue operation was a total clusterfuck, he told the Daily Beast. Wow. Alleging that Sinoproc was bogged down by bureaucracy, which negatively affected this case. Strong words from Jose Feliciano Gonzalez. Feliciano Gonzalez. John Tornblum. Oh. Feliciano Gonzalez is, is the, the guide. I know. That's what I thought. The suspicious was... guide. Tornblum is just another local guide. Okay. Not all guides are. Sh- hashtag not all guides. <laughs> yes. Security director of Sinoproc, Lesia Espinoza, did admit to Crit, or Crit, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, Jeremy, that the first phase of the search suffered because no one knew where to look for Lasan and Chris. Um, this, is, at this isn't point, that the first first like problem of, of <laughs> any search? Yes. Uh, any trace of them, including the eventually telltale backpack with digital camera, hadn't been found yet. Mm-hmm. So Sinoproc to this point had no clue what trail the girls could have taken uh, once they maybe reached the summit. Because again, we didn't have evidence of that until the camera was found. They didn't even necessarily, would they even have known that they were taking the the Pianista is a very popular trail, so they would have assumed the girls were taking that trail, and they had said, oh, we're going to go up the Pianista to right. people. But poor Feliciano is like, they would never have gone without me. I'm sh- I'm certain they waited. Well, because he says he thought they had an appointment. So yeah, if they really did have an appointment, it's a weird thing to do. I don't know. Uh, they didn't ex- tell anyone expressly where they were going if it was anywhere aside from just the pianista and back and of course they hadn't planned on going down the other side of the continental divide you would think and getting lost so it was that's, that's a if it was that's a bad plan not a good i'm plan. gonna put that right out there it's just about impossible to narrow down the search to a tight grid which is basically the best way to find a missing person in an area like a forest as we learned in our db cooper episode mm-hmm. look all the way back for that <laughs> Way, way back in time. So meanwhile, the girls still seem to be desperately trying to contact civilization despite their lack of cell phone reception. The search began on April 3rd, 
and this at this time uh, the phone made a call to 911 at 9:33 a.m. with no connection. Mm. Now again, the phones hadn't been found at this point. I'm just kind of putting them on a timeline. The Samsung was turned on at 1:50 p.m., but no emergency call was attempted. Hmm. So they might have just been checking if there was reception. Maybe they wanted to preserve the battery. The same thing happened again at 4 p.m. with the iPhone and at 4.19 p.m. again with the Samsung. At this point, Feliciano himself stated he tried to search the trail after the summit, but found no trace of the girls and not even any footprints on the ground. Hmm. On April 4th, when Lisanne's brother, uncle, and a friend arrived in Boquete to help with the search... Uh, and the search was starting to encompass the Lost Waterfalls area and the Quetzal Trail. The, the Quetzal Trail. Yeah, it sounds kind of tasty. Well, with peanut butter, certainly it would be. <laughs> so at this point, the iPhone was turned on twice at 10.16 a.m. and 1.42 p.m., I think, uh, with no emergency call attempted. So it seems at this point they were losing hope about actually connecting to any phone reception if it was coming up that they had no service and they were just turning on the phone to see if any reception had been found maybe they're checking the time who knows sure you'd want to if you were lost you would want to conserve your battery Mm -hmm. and check whenever you get somewhere high or whenever you think you've gotten closer to civilization so here's the catch 22 and this is something that all let our listeners know. If you ever get lost and you don't have reception, the best thing to do is to get as high as you possibly can and try to get reception there. The catch-22 is you have to be extremely careful because you don't want to fall from somewhere extremely high. So only do it if you can do it safely. Right. That doesn't necessarily mean climb the tallest redwood. No, or even the tallest cliff or whatever. But if there's... A hill. A hill, you know, something with less coverage, certainly try that for sure. The Samsung wasn't turned on at all at this point um, on the 4th, and it's likely its battery had faded more than the iPhone had. So, What are you saying about Samsung <laughs> I'm not saying anything. The proof is in the pudding. On April 5th, the Samsung was turned on at 4.50 a.m. with no emergency call attempt, and again at 5.56 a.m., and at this point, the battery was exhausted and the phone never turned on again. So that they la- knew that's when the battery died. Right. That last turn on must have been a real, real bummer. Yeah. After 1050 a.m., the iPhone was turned on with no emergency call attempt. And after this specific point, whenever the iPhone was turned on, no pin or a wrong pin was entered to try and unlock it. This likely means that it was Lasanne trying to access Chris's phone because Chris owned the iPhone. And for whatever reason, Chris was unable to type in the pin herself to unlock the iPhone. Oh, geez. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That does make sense because the Samsung was still being turned on and used correctly. Until it died. Right. As the search continued, the iPhone was turned on again at 1.37 p.m. April 5th. 10.26 a.m. and 1.37 p.m. April 6th. Not at all, or it's unclear if it was April 7th through 10th, and then for two final times at 10.51 a.m. and 11.56 a.m. April 11th. These were all with wrong or no pins entered, and sadly at 11.56 a.m. April 11th, the phone was powered off for the last time. And that's nine days after they went missing? Yep. Uh, I feel like these girls got 127 hours. Sinoproc conducted a 10-day search utilizing helicopters, dogs, and ground teams. They showed pictures of the girls to local indigenous peoples in hopes that someone, anyone, had seen them. No leads turned up, and after this time, they decided to curtail efforts because it had been 10 days, and unfortunately, they didn't have a lot of hope. A Dutch team came in with their own trained dogs at the end of May, but heavy rains affected the search, which is uh, an issue in a rainforest, and nothing was found at this point either. Then, in mid-June 2014, 
a Ngobe woman from a village named Alto Romero walked into the Boquete police station holding Lisanne Frun's backpack. Ooh, that, that's a development. This woman claimed that she found the backpack while tending to her rice paddy about five miles from where the victims were last seen on the powerful river called the Culebra, or the Serpent. She told officers that the pack was wedged into a mess of junk and flotsam on the shore of the riverbank, and she was certain it hadn't been stuck there the day before. Apparently, I guess she had been there. At this point, the contents of the backpack were discovered and studied, and they include 83 U.S. dollars, two pairs of sunglasses, Lasanne's passport, Lasanne's camera, a water bottle, and two bras. These could have been bikini tops. It's unclear. So according to a statement from the prosecutor, the backpack showed signs of dragging and had residue of sand and leaves throughout, though the electronics inside were relatively undamaged. The Dutch Forensic Institute experts found more than 30 unidentified fingerprints on the contents of Lasanne's backpack, but none of those have been traced to anyone in Panama. It's unclear if the Panamanian uh, officials took those fingerprints. I couldn't really get a read on that. Or left the, those fingerprints. <laughs> yeah. Um, you usually have the people working on a case do fingerprints, and then you can easily... Well, first of all, you shouldn't be getting your fingerprints on shit, but um, you can rule them out that way. I just don't know who's going, what stranger is going through their backpack, leaving the digital camera, 83 American dollars and two passports behind and throwing it back in the river. Well, that's the point that many people make um, against foul play. Why would you do something and leave all that good stuff behind, including the phones and, and all that proof of stuff, maybe? And if you're a murderer, certainly, why would you stop at identity theft? Mm -hmm. So once this discovery was made pinpointing the backpack to the Calibra River, a whole new search set out. Intense searching was undertaken along the river, which Jeremy Kreit says was captained by the same guy that the girls were supposed to, or maybe not, meet the day after their disappearance. He's very involved. Yes. He's very involved throughout this whole story. Why does he insist on being involved? I don't want to cast more aspersion onto Mr. Gonzalez, but it is a common thing that many people who have perpetuated a crime involve themselves in the investigation. Yeah, we talk about this with uh, Jerry Brudos. We talk about this with uh, Ed Kemper. Mm Mm-hmm. Sadly, between mid-June and late August, 33 skeletal fragments had been discovered and linked to Lisanne Froon and Chris Kremers via DNA testing. Most of the bones were from Lisanne's left foot, still in its boot and sock, found behind a tree near the river. Other bone fragments, including a bone and skin fragment from Lisanne, were discovered a 14-hour hike north from where the girls were last definitively known to be in photo 508. Mm Mm-hmm. May seem like only Lisanne's remains are being found at this point, but unfortunately, some of Chris's remains were also discovered, just a less amount. Her pelvis bone and a rib bone were found. Uh, I'm not clear on where, aside from just the jungle. Right. There were a couple of interesting things about these bones. They contained traces of phosphorus, they didn't show any marks or abrasions, and the pelvis bone had been almost broken in half. So let's address these things thanks to the great work of the kremersfroon.pbworks.com page, because I am not a pathologist. But there are, boy, there's a lot of manpower on this on the internet, huh? There's a whole subreddit. This is a huge, I mean, it's very active. This is a huge, I couldn't possibly include, so like, if any of you subredditors, I really appreciate your work, and if it's not included in here, it it would be hours and hours of podcasting. Wow. Yeah. Traces of phosphorus could have possibly been sourced from lime. Soil samples taken where the bones were found showed that this was not naturally occurring in the soil. Phosphorus is, however, used by farmers as fertilizer in the region, but it doesn't occur naturally in the jungle area where the bones were discovered. Okay, and phosphorus was on the bones, meaning like after the bones had been out of a body already, they were near 
farm stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. Some Panamanian investigators thought that the phosphates could have come from the stomach acid of a large animal or animals Mm -hmm. who swallowed the bones and then expelled them again in one way or another. Number two, no marks or abrasions. Well, that hurts the large animal eating the bones theory. Yes, you would usually see bite marks, scraping, but it also means no obvious signs of trauma by sharp objects, projectiles, firearms, no stabbing or shooting. Now, keep in mind, most of this is a leg bone and a pelvis, so you might not see those things anyway, if there were stabbing or shooting. There were no marks at the remains that would indicate they had spent a long while in the river systems. They didn't look like they had been dragged down the river system a long distance, so that may indicate the remains weren't in the area for very long before they were discovered. I wonder how you can tell that. I mean, certainly all the skin was gone, right? Mostly? Mostly. Lasan had some fragments of skin attached to the bone fragments. But so what about... I'm sure a... mostly the foot. But so what about it didn't... By the way, how long were they, were they missing before they found these bones? Uh, I think they started finding them in late June or July, and they'd been missing since April 1st. Okay. It seems... It seems quicker than I would have thought to just have have bones out there, but um, some people agree with that. Yes. So I just wonder how the how they don't look like they've been dragged down a river. That's also a weird thing, they, isn't it? They sound river dragged to mm-hmm. me. So lastly, the pelvis bone. Now, if you've seen a pelvis bone, they're incredibly thick bones. A lot of force is needed to fracture and almost break a pelvis bone in half in the manner that it was especially because this is an area that's fairly well protected by surrounding body, like the groin, the backside, thighs. I mean, it's a lot of muscle and fat and skin protecting the pelvis. Mm -hmm. Some feel this breakage looks similar to injuries seen in a serious car accident or a fall from a great height. It seems like Chris's fragmental remains had incurred some bleaching, possibly from the sun. sun. Yeah. Visual bleaching, while Lasans had not. And uh, as I said, I think the only skin fag- fragments that were found were Lasans. Lasans foot metatarsals, so these are the bones on top of the foot. There's a bunch of little bones, were broken. The heel, ankle, and all the other bones below this area were intact and unbroken, and they were all discovered inside of her hiking boot. The forensic examiner came to the conclusion that there's only a 50% chance this kind of break was caused by a fall from a great height. Um, What's the other 50%? 50% it was from a different injury like a rock fall or a solid object of some sort coming down from above and striking the foot, breaking the metatarsals. I see. Just because it's the top of the foot that you wouldn't think that area would get broken from a fall. Right. Well, apparently 50% you would. 50%. So it's as likely as something falling on the foot. Yeah. It seems like these breaks were caused while Lasan was likely alive due to the heel and other bones not being broken. Um, none of Lasan's ha- bones had abrasions on them either, like Chris's. Mm-hmm. And they also didn't suffer any of the normal wear and tear that you'd expect had they been washed down the river, which seems to indicate that these bones hadn't been in the area very long when they were discovered. Again, they keep saying that, but they are just bones. Yeah, I, I think, that, you know, there's tumbling. I mean, maybe they were remarkably well preserved for a bunch of bones. I don't know. Yeah, they're only, I mean, I just think you, they're I only... I mean, you could, see, you could see at least the pelvis bone, but it doesn't look like much to me because I'm not an expert. Yeah. Yeah. Lastly, and this is pretty gross, so warning there, a rolled up piece of Lasanne's skin coming from her shin bone was found with maggots still present, and this was in August. This indicates the skin was still in the early stages of decomposition, despite it being almost four months and a whole summer since Lasanne went missing. The pathologist also felt that due to the way the skin had been manipulated, the body had likely been in a constricted space, which would have changed the shape of the skin to what it ended up being. Apparently that happens. You look 
The, confused. The corpse w- was was in a constricted space, or the living body was in a constricted space. The body with the skin on it, right? Wherever so the skin either. had been. Okay. Okay. So, what conclusions can we draw from this, Carrie? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just telling you what I saw. I think these girls got very lost. I think Chris got hurt very badly, possibly in a fall. And at a certain point, um, I think Lisanne was just out there unwilling to leave her friend for dead, right? Uh, And not that she knew where she could go anyway, without cell phone service, no idea where she is. They had hiked 14 hours in the wrong direction presumably didn't want to keep hiking in the wrong direction. Um, And then after that cell phone dies, who knows where they ended up. And I think those bones just washed down the river back to... Well, it was found near the... Like, it was still in the forest. Mm. And like you, forensic specialists concluded, due to this evidence, that the girls slipped and fell from a cliff. Forensic pathologist and head of the Dutch research team, Frank van der Goot, stated, quote, the Goot! <laughs> having taken the geographical and social conditions into account with the technical facts that emerge from the forensic investigation, a crime in the form of robbery, rape, violent crime, or kidnapping is very unlikely. Mm-hmm. However, unlike the Dutch conclusion, the Panamanian report felt the girls fell from the first monkey bridge along the path. I think these are like two ropes, uh, and I might be wrong about this, two ropes that are suspended um, vertically, and then you shuffle across with your feet on one, and then you hang with your hands from the top one. So there's a bottom rope and a top rope, and you kind of make your way across that way. Yeah, that seems super safe for tourists. It's not, and you're not supposed to take those bridges um but they were in the wrong place at some point in either of these scenarios the bodies may have been carried by the strong currents in the rivers at the bottom of these areas making further remains difficult to find but this doesn't tie the case up in a bow not at all Uh, if they fell why weren't more of their remains found The remains themselves seem to indicate for both girls that they weren't carried, broken, and battered as they were swept downriver. So that point made by both teams seems incorrect. The first emergency call occurred only hours after the summit of the Pianista. So how did they get lost? It seems like there's only one clear path on each side of the summit. Did something happen? So I said that on April 11th, Chris's iPhone which was likely being accessed by Lasanne, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. because it wasn't the correct pin or Uh, they didn't have a pin. I agree. Was powered off for the final time. But this is not the last bit of evidence the girls left before the remains found in June. Oh, by the way, how did they know the phone was being turned on and off? Apparently, the phone logs that sort of thing. Even, but they did they ever find their phones? Yeah, they were both in the backpack. Oh, they were in the backpack. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. And they weren't, they were not really damaged at all. So during the search, as the girls were continuing to make phone calls, the authorities didn't know that in real time. They only found no. that out later. Well, that's why I was saying, like, they found the phones and camera later, but I kind of strung it together into a timeline. Yeah, I think it was very effective and gripping. And confusing to you. <laughs> well, hopefully not to our listeners. <laughs> no, but we're just clarifying now. Okay. So, with this last bit of evidence, there's even a minor mystery here, too. The last daytime photo was 508, but the photos eventually go up to 609, I think. But number 509, so this is what would have been the one right after the normal pictures of the girl's pianista climb, right. is missing. No trace of 509 was recovered from the camera. If it were manually deleted from the camera, so if someone took a picture, didn't like it, deleted it themselves using the camera menu, there would have been a record of this in the data processor. When the Netherlands Forensic Institute experts examined the camera, they reached the conclusion that either 509 was deleted via computer, 
you know, when you upload and you can delete via the software. Mm -hmm. Or there was a technical malfunction, which is rare, that occurred on the camera itself, corrupted the file and just erased it completely, even from existing. But it seems unlikely that anyone had their hands on that camera to get it to a computer in between. Certainly, yeah. And if deletion did occur, it would have happened after the rest of the photos were taken because they keep going up in the same order. 510, 511. If Chris or Lisanne had deleted it right after they took it, then there would have been another 509. Right. But what if they But now it's just 508, 510. Right. What if they deleted it after they took 510, though? Then it would keep counting the numbers up. Maybe, but there would have been a, a log of a manual delete. Mm. So that's kind of the catch-22 here. So the other pictures. They're pretty unsettling, and they've spurred a lot of controversy and conjecture, as you would imagine. After 5.08, the camera was unused for seven days until 1 a.m. on April 8th. Uh, this is, the beginning of this is two nighttime photographs taken, with one looking down from the top of a rock into bushes, and the second of a top of a rock with two sticks entwined with red plastic bag and two chewing gum wrappers. Huh. Interesting little art piece. Well, it could have been some sort of marker, perhaps, or trying to leave evidence that they were there mm -hmm. for any searchers. During the next three hours, 88 more pictures were taken, and all but one, which was originally held by request of the families, were described as black or very dark. And the black ones wouldn't have been caused by a lens cap because it was an automatic shutter, just right. like most digital cameras. Right. Criminalist Dick Steffens, who examined the photos on behalf of the families, stated, one explanation for the dark pictures could be that the woman had been locked up and using the flash on the camera to try and attract attention. That was, that was an interesting way of phrasing this, locked up. That's also... Uh... I don't know. I don't know who she would have been trying to att attract attention from. Well, the searchers were going on at this time. There weren't any pictures of paths or specifically of either of the girls, and because of this, some speculate that the girls were just using the camera flash as an improvised flashlight to guide their way in the dark jungle. Yes, I see. I see. That made that makes sense to me. Some photos that have been released have interesting aspects to them. One appears to be like maybe the edge of someone's face or arm with a bit of hair poking out of the corner of the frame. Yeah, there's definitely hair involved. And the flash is kind of reflecting off of this object, which could be skin. A lot are of dense greenery and some flowing water. Um, and many of these... Mm -hmm. That just looks like the ground. Mm-hmm. Looks like that one's actually really nice is that stars over overhead no so these are like glowing orbs so ghosts <sighs> hundreds no. of ghosts no, these it looks like the flash is capturing some sort of rainfall which will happen the one that gained the most attention and i don't know if this is the one that the family is originally held back is what appears to be the back of chris's head and all we can see is her blonde hair I don't see any blood or anything like that. The hair looks pretty clean and dry, which is strange for someone who's been in the jungle for a week. Um, here's that picture. It's not like disturbing or anything. That looks like uh, very clean and dry hair. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm not sure it looks like the back of a head. Everywhere said that this was Lisanne's hair, or Chris's Chris hair, I'm sorry. And Chris has already stopped opening her own iPhone at this point? Yes. That's interesting, because I would have assumed my head canon timeline was that she had uh, fallen by this by this point, which is why you said the thing about no blood. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, it almost looks like a doll, doll hair or a wig. It's very clean hair. Mm -hmm. um, after this, there's a bunch more of this kind of blackness or greenery or orb photography, and 609 was the last photo taken, at 4.10 a.m. Frank Van de Goot noted, you can't really exclude a crime, but I remain of the opinion that it was an accident scenario. You can scream and shout what you will, the jungle absorbs everything. 
There is constant off-land wind, dogs can't smell you, and there is no phone reception. If they had been kidnapped, we've heard nothing to confirm that. And of course, just an aside, sex trafficking was, of course, brought up because they were two pretty white tourists. Right. Normally, people get in touch and ask for money. I can't completely exclude a crime, but I have nothing to prove that. With an accident, there are a few possibilities, but I can't prove it. But this point isn't satisfying to many, even locals. The previous guide that we talked about, Torn Blom, um, told Daily Beast that if it really was an accident, why couldn't they find more remains? Where are all the big bones? Where are the skulls? There are no animals up there that would eat a skull. Well, there's no animals anywhere that would eat a skull. Well, you could eat something all in one, like maybe a bear or something, but it seems like there isn't big enough animals for that. While journalist Jeremy Kreit made sure to state that there was no hard evidence against the rancher and guide Feliciano Gonzalez, he remains under suspicion by Tormblom and others in the local guiding community. Guide on guide. Some of our female clients have complained of him harassing them. And Tornblom noted that apparently he had a habit of bathing in the hot springs with female tourists, which was something that was against code. Well, this is just gossip. Let Feliciano, assuming he's not a murderer, let him have his fun. He ought to at least be interrogated the right way, Tornblom said. With a blowtorch. <laughs> if this happened in the States or in Europe, the investigation would have been taken to a whole different level. He's the last guy to see I've them- seen it on American Program 24. <laughs> I think he was a Western man, actually. I don't think he has I've seen it on the program uh, 24. <laughs> he's the last guy to see them alive, and then he's the one who finds their bones. Something about that just feels wrong to me. I don't think he was the documented last to see the girls alive, since they had witnesses on the Pianista Trail, but he certainly paints a picture, and he was part of the search party. Um, so, who knows? Mm-hmm. The Daily Beast sought out several experts to review the case and the evidence, including Carl Wheel, a master fellow in wilderness medicine with decades of search and rescue and forensics experience. Wow. That's a pretty specific area of expertise. <laughs> you know what? Just you pick something so specific, you're going to be the guy. Wheel concluded that, quote, the initial event that prevented the women from returning to Boquete along the Pianista Trail was almost certainly not criminal. I don't see any evidence of foul play. They're continuing to take pictures and use their phones. I'd say that makes it look like some kind of accident, at least initially. After a week of constant hunger and exposure to the elements suffered by one or both of the girls, they would be psychologically and physically impaired, experiencing a loss of quickness, strength, and agility. However, the Dutch team concluded that Chris and Lisanne could not have lost their way on the trail because it was clearly marked. So what happened? Well, people can just be like, people can make mistakes, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I personally have a very shaky theory, but what do you think, Sean? Do you have the same theory as before? Yeah, I do. I I mean, it. I just think a lot of 127 hours, honestly, when I hear this story. Mm-hmm. And that actual thing that happened to that actual guy whose name I forget. Is it Aaron Ralston? If you say so. Maybe. You know, when <laughs> when James Franco went hiking in Utah and he uh, he ended up having to cut off his own arm with a pocket knife. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you get into these really remote areas, it could be that you... you and people f- don't know you're there. And- you fall somewhere and no one knows where you are and there's no way to get out for, you know... Help. Weeks. Nobody's yeah. coming for weeks as long as it takes to uh, die of thirst or exposure or wild animals or whatever. Yeah. So there are things that really bother me, and I'll, I can mention those. But the, the deaths of two promising young women? <laughs> no, of course. I mean, bits of evidence confusing parts of this case. Bounce them off me. Well, the things that bother me are... The night pictures. What were they doing? I using the phone, using the camera as a flashlight makes all yes. sense. Yes. Now, some people, of course, are saying someone was following them and they were trying to get a picture of them or light them up or whatever. Some people thought they saw things in the photos. I didn't see anything in the pictures. Just put yourself in that situation. If you're in the deep dark jungle and you think someone's following you over the course of like what hours, right? Mm-hmm. 
is your days at this point is your method going to be turn around and take pictures at them as you keep just walking shambling at this point a week without water uh shambling forward and hoping they don't catch up if you scare them away with your flashlight i don't i don't know but yeah that's something that bothers me what happened there um the fact that the bones didn't look like they had gone down river let me say something about this <laughs> you yes can't, Sean. you can't have these both of these things both of these things don't work together for me a the bones it's weird that the bones look like no, nothing happened to them they, they look pristine there was no assault and also these bodies look way too decomposed and destroyed to have only been here for a month well okay don't those both have the same answer they got they washed don't have down the... full bodies the most they have is the pelvic bone fragment mm -hmm. from chris and the foot from lasanne yeah so it's hard to determine that at all. But you can't say, and these don't look like they've, uh, these don't look beat up enough for going down the river. Because the pelvis has a crack in it, and all of the bones have the skin torn off. The bones probably didn't tear off, first of all. The skin that was preserved was mostly in the shoe, which makes sense. Because animals will eat the other skin. Mm-hmm. Or it'll rot. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very hot area. The breakage seems, it seems that people think that happened during life. It wasn't just a, a break that happens when you drop something or things tumble. Mm -hmm. That's something that happened while these girls were alive. I'll leave that to the pathologist. I don't know how that shit works. I, I think it, it makes sense to me that Chris could have broken her pelvis in a fall. That would have ended her life before Lisanne's, and that's why you have Lisanne uh, using Chris's phone toward the end. Mm-hmm. So that bugs me. Um, the hair picture bugs me. That's weird. And listeners, that's the one to look at. Again, I'm, I feel bad if that's the one that the family's tried to keep yeah, back. Yeah, I'm but... not sure. I think most of them have been leaked at this point, so I couldn't tell which were originally released and not. It's not just how clean that looks. It could just be the way it's caught in the flash or something. But it looks, again, like doll hair to me. Like um, It's very, very blonde, so you would notice blood or something. Some people say they see blood. I don't see blood. Anyway, um, so that bugs me. The One of the biggest things that bugs me is did they have a, a guided tour or not booked? Why would you take a hike the day before you're supposed to take that hike? And if not, then that guy's lying. Why is he lying? I agree that's weird. Let me I could Unless again the girls ghosted him or were planning to ghost him. I could throw a really weird scenario at the wall. Sure. This guide brings these girls out to the jungle, loses them, doesn't murder them, loses them by accident. But he's not in any of the pictures. Oh, that's... Which could it could be totally true, you know, like oh they just didn't take pictures of him. But you would think that he'd be in one of them, right? And hadn't he shown up before in their picture role, like when they first met him? No, the the Dutch boys, oh, okay. <laughs> the Dutch fellas. I don't think he's in the picture role. So this guy, that's what I was thinking. It's just like he if, he, if he's like them. he's like oh shit yeah oh shit I'll never work in this town again maybe. Um. But it was probably before one of them got injured because you would think he would go back to town and say someone got hurt. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I, he could have gone back like, well, I don't know where those girls went. And then he goes back. Uh, unless he was like, you know, you guys want to see something really crazy. Check out this monkey bridge. And then when <laughs> one of them goes falling over the edge, he's just like, oh, <sighs> bolts. You know, it's an interesting point. It's an interesting point. Now, I'm not saying that happened. I don't want to put that on poor Feliciano, who I think there's no evidence that he did anything wrong. The thing that really, the thing that bugs me the most is this Issue tour of whether they had a tour booked. I know. Uh, I Maybe they were just going to ghost him. Maybe they had the idea to go the next day and then, hey, some time freed up. Was this supposed to be their first day of work? I don't know if they thought it was. Um... But their first day of work was supposed to be the next week. The next week, right. So as a woman, <laughs> as a woman, and as someone who has traveled with another woman, my friend Sarah, I've traveled with a bunch, um, 
we've totally encountered creepy guys while traveling. Sure. And there are you times mean guys. <laughs> yes. There are times when you feel kind of awkward or th- even a little threatened by turning someone down. So I can totally buy as a young woman alone with like another woman being like, oh, yeah, sure. Sounds great. See you tomorrow. Whatever. Because they felt uncomfortable. That's, but I just wish I knew what it was, you know. So this is what I think happened. Okay. And this is very tenuous. Sometime around when the first emergency call was made, a few hours after the pianista summit, you know, right before the call, one of the girls was injured in an accident. Mm-hmm. Probably Chris. Maybe she had a horrible fall, and maybe that's when her pelvic bone was broken. Lisanne would either have not wanted to leave her to go get help, or she didn't know the way back and was afraid of losing her way or not being able to find Chris again. Both of the girls, it seems, were at least alive until April 5th. This is when Lisanne's Samsung battery died and the first occurrence of the wrong pin being entered into Chris's phone. Well, so Chris could have died on April 4th, but the Samsung was still being used. Because wasn't there yes. a day or two when Chris's phone wasn't turned on at all? Um, the iPhone, no. The iPhone lasted the longest. The day or two was the 7th to the 10th. The first occurrence of the wrong pin being entered into Chris's phone, I think, was on April 5th. Suggesting she wasn't oh, able I'm to sorry. do it herself or couldn't. Gotcha. Maybe at this point she was unconscious or had passed away. Mm-hmm. And Lisanne was desperately trying to access her phone. Now, I'm unsure if iPhones had the emergency call capability without unlocking in 2014. They do now. So you can swipe and you could select emergency call um, or medical ID, I mm-hmm. think. And that's in case of emergency. Maybe, you know, someone's fainted and you found them with their phone or whatever. You have to call. I feel That's the only way that you could get into it quote-unquote, into a phone without unlocking it. I feel strongly that was already a feature on all smartphones by 2014. I think so, too, but again, maybe she didn't know because I don't know if it was a choice because she saw there was no reception, so there was no point in bothering, or she just didn't know she could try an emergency call um, even without unlocking the phone because she couldn't unlock the phone. Right. The night photos were taken on April 8th. And I'm unsure if both girls were alive at this point, but someone was. Uh, Even though there was a picture of the back of Chris's head, horribly, there's no indication whether Chris was alive at this point. Some felt they saw blood in her hair. I don't know why you'd take a picture like that if someone was dead, but I don't know. They probably weren't, Lisanne or whoever wasn't thinking clearly. My theory is at the very least, Lisanne did survive past this point to when the iPhone was powered on on April 11th, but either succumbed to the elements or an injury, maybe that to her foot, which led her to pass away from some combination of ex- a combination of exposure, illness, sickness, whatever, because they would also be eating weird stuff at this point and drinking river water and probably very sick also. For sure. The fact that Lisanne's remains had decomposed less seems to give credence to this. Um, Kathy Reichs, who is a forensic anthropologist and the creator of the show Bones, also feels it was an accident. And the Daily Beast had talked to her. And um, some of the weird things, like the bleaching of Chris's rib bone and the inconsistent rate of decay, wasn't an issue for Reichs. Because she said the rainforest is a place of many micro-environments, so preservation or decomposition of body parts could occur at different rates Mm -hmm. in areas that might even be close to each other. Chris's shorts were found, um, apparently zipped up and neatly folded on a rock high above the Culebra waterline in an area east of where it appears the night photos were taken. Hmm. So if this is the case, it seems... Likely that Lasanne made it across the first river uh, depicted in the photos, maybe leaving Chris's shorts as a marker. And because her remains seem to be intermingled with Chris's, Lasanne likely died in this area or very close by. Mm-hmm. 
She could have fallen from one of the rope rope monkey bridges that crossed the rivers or the cable crossing near the shorts marker. And if she fell and broke her foot, it would have made it impossible for her to proceed down the trail. And maybe she was even more badly injured. We don't know. Right. Because we don't, we only have the foot. Yeah. Carl Wheel, the survival expert that we just talked about, concluded this. You could say they both did an amazing job against impossible odds, describing Lysanne's action in her last days and perhaps hours as impressively brave under truly terrible circumstances. Based on the evidence, it seems she didn't just sit down and shrivel up and wait to starve. And perhaps this is how we should end this terrible story, with heroism despite the odds and a memory that will live on in Panama and beyond forever. I would love to leave it right there, but I, I have to know, what's the tenor of the online community? Is it a subreddit just full of people trying to find a murder in all this? Um, There are a lot of people that think a crime took place. A lot. But I think most of the web investigation is with good intentions. It always is. Hi, Tara. Hi, Nick. I've got a question for you. A hypothetical question. Here for it. If you and I were to make a podcast... Why would we make a podcast? Why does anyone make a podcast? Massive egos. Anyway. If you and I were to make a podcast... Right, so if we were to make a podcast where we ask each other hypothetical questions... <laughs> Wait, so but not only is this a podcast about listening to an old married couple argue, it's explicitly about nonsense? That's right. Okay, I'm with you so far. So what would we call this hypothetical podcast? Well, I think we'd call it Unloaded Questions, a podcast about lighthearted musing and loving debate. And excellent action work. With your co-hosts, Nick and Tara. Now, babe, why would anyone listen to a podcast like this? Well, maybe after a year locked inside their own houses, people want a break from heavy news or serial killers and just want to wonder how many Sasquatch eye it would take to successfully capture Nessie. I think it's Sasquatches. It's a Latin root. I'm pretty sure it's Sasquatch eye. Unloaded Questions, with your hosts, Nick and Tara, dropping Wednesday at a podcatcher near you. Hey, Tara, what's a group of Sasquatch I called? A Foot Clan. Ugh, Nick, people are going to have to hear this out more than once. Foot Clan. Ugh. Let's perk up with a story of new life with weird science. Oh, yeah! A South African woman by the name of Gosiame Tamara Sitole of Tembisa Township, a Kurhuleni, has given birth to decouplets. That's how, how ten, many? ten kids. Ten that's, kids in one go. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that's too many kids. <laughs> Sitole's husband, Teboho Sotsetsi, stated doctors originally thought she was pregnant with six tuplets, six children, but later discovered the scan had missed two. Apparently, that's something that can happen. Oh, it's just like with my, uh, I had wisdom teeth. I had a couple extra <laughs> ones of those floating around up in my head. They had to really dig in there and get them out. So uh, this is like that, but with uh, humans. Yeah, full-on babies. Uh, they were expecting eight, but when doctors performed a cesarean days ago, they found seven boys and three girls for a total of ten babies. Sitole was seven months and seven days pregnant, and... Premature birth is common for twins and any variation on twins. Sure, you just need more real estate, presumably? Yeah. The couple told reporters that she became pregnant without any fertility treatments. As you might know, it's fairly common for in vitro fertilization and other treatments like this to produce multiples, but apparently they got this all the natural way. Well, I'm glad they went with a cesarean because that would put some real wear and tear on the... Um on the exit ramp there. Ugh. Ten babies. Yeah. At this point, the babies are all okay, spending a few weeks in an incubator until they're strong enough to go home. Sitole is now believed to be the world record holder for most babies safely delivered in a pregnancy, with the previous record of nine being held by Halima Cease of Morocco just last month. Before that, the famous Octomom gave birth to eight in 2009. Wow. 
Uh, well, I can't wait until these kids grow up and start their own superhero crime fighting team. All wear matching jumpsuits and uh, domino masks. Yeah, their very own Umbrella Academy. Uh, well, hopefully written better. <laughs> oh boy. Well, congrats to the family and best of luck. Thanks for spending some time with us this week, guys. And uh, first things last. Huh? Well, we're at the end of the episode here. It's not a first things first situation. <laughs> uh, we're a network, y'all. We're like, um, we're podcast magnets, you and I. Uh, I guess. Sitting in our ivory tower of <laughs> podcasting and looking down at all the little people. Our subterranean basement of podcasting. You could call it that. It doesn't even really have like, it doesn't look like a, anyway. <laughs> um, our podcast empire grows, oh boy. ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it, it, the whole phase two of this epic campaign of world domination, world podcast domination. I'm rolling my eyes so hard right now. Starts this week <clears throat> because yesterday our friends Nick and Tara Salisi released the first episode of their very own podcast unloaded questions yes they launched on june 9th so be sure to listen subscribe give them a great rating and review and you can like unloaded questions on facebook and follow at unloaded q for twitter and at unloaded questions for instagram and for all your long boy updates check out longboymedia.com that's l-o-n-g-b-o-i media.com and everywhere else at Longboy Media. Again, B-O-I. Yeah, that was a baffling business decision on our point. <laughs> uh, but it makes us laugh. So uh, th that's going to be the umbrella for all of our uh, creative projects going forward. And as of now, uh, also a podcast network with us, Unloaded Questions, uh, which, by the way, is Nick and Tara uh, hitting each other. You just heard an ad a little, little while ago. It's Nick yeah, it's and improv, comedy. Rhetorical questions, would you rather? Just a lot of casual fun. Uh, in a similar way to how this podcast is like hanging out with us because we talk about um, macabre <laughs> stuff and have graveyard laughs all the time. The macabre macabes. The macabre macabes. Uh, Nick and Tara hanging out with them is, is a lot of being peppered with would you rather <laughs> questions. And uh, nobody does it better. So go check them out. It's exactly the kind of nonsense that I like to listen to. And um, that's the highest endorsement I can give. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and also, watch for Love Affairs coming soon, hosted by our very own Carrie McCabe, my wife. <laughs> my wife. <laughs> my wife. Yeah, we'll announce more about that later, but that's going to be just uh, just me telling you about some famous love stories throughout time. Very different from this podcast. Uh, so that's uh, very exciting stuff coming around the corner from Longboy Media. So uh, keep your ears peeled. Ew. Is that an expression? Hope not. And that's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary. And check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We'll be forever grateful. We certainly will. And please do come and join us on Patreon. And uh, we always offer special thanks to our top-tier patrons. Currently, that would include Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, and Comfy Mike. Thank you, guys. We love you very much. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe, music by Kyle Ryan. You can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. This has been a production of Longboy Media. <laughs> <laughs>